and share these great stories, you know, about my clients and people who um, I have the privilege of meeting. And, um, you know, just being able to um, share those stories across a platform and sharing information that would be, that would be beneficial to folks. Um, so I've created this kind of platform. It's called Reflections from the Chair. Things that I've seen over the years, you know, as a barber, you know, working, seeing a lot of things, you know, in the barbershop. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, just really wanting to share some great information um, you know, with uh, with my clients, I I shouldn't be the only one privy to this. You know, great um, to these great folks and uh, the work that they do, and being able to share that. So, um, y- here you are, reflections from the chair. <laughs> well, I'm sure you've got some stories to tell too, because it's not just about reflection. You got some tea to spill as well. Oh my gosh! Right. Well, that, that's going to be in the book. <laughs> that's going to be in the book coming. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little bit about you, uh, Dr. Brooke. Tell me a little bit about you, where you're from, who are you, you know, how did you get into, uh, you know, your line of work, your practice? Tell us a little yeah. bit about you. Yeah. So um, I am Dr. Brooke. I'm a board certified dermatologist mm-hmm. and I am the owner of Skin Wellness Dermatology Associates in Durham, North Carolina. And I am also a healthy skin advocate. And Mm. so everything that I do with regard to dermatologists are medical doctors who go to school for 12 years Mm -hmm. um, from medical school, college, um, residency. But we are experts in hair, skin, and nail disorders. That's what Mm. dermatologists do. So it's not just the frou-frou. It's, um, you know, we see some pretty serious skin, nail, and hair disorders. Yeah. And so um, with that said, I always like to educate my patients because I think if you understand what is going on and you understand your disease process, then you are much more likely to comply with the treatment plan and you're most much more likely to have proper expectations about results. And, you know, interestingly in dermatology, um, one of my aha moments was um, that I realized we actually don't cure a lot of things in dermatology. Most of what we see are chronic conditions like acne, okay. eczema, psoriasis. And so it's really important to make sure that a patient understands what might trigger it and how to manage that and how to avoid certain things and what maybe to eat or not eat mm-hmm. so that they will better be able to take care of themselves in the long run. You know, that, that's a big gap, um, especially, you know, with the guys, you know, that I've seen over the years in terms of um, proper things of what to do. We, a lot of times we're not taught. I know, you know, myself, you know, growing up, you know, my mom didn't really take the time and say, okay, this is what you should be using on your skin. You know, this is what you should be using, you know, in your hair and things of that nature. And all along, you know, during the years I've seen guys, you know, I ask, um, you know, what are some of the things you use, you know, for your hair or shampoo? Oh, I use soap. You know, like soap, no. But I think that it's just a big gap. In Not the... just soap, but the bar soap. <laughs> the bar <laughs> soap, exactly. Right. Yeah. The hotel soap. Yeah, yeah. That was just even worse. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think that there's, a, you know, a huge knowledge gap there, you know, with the guys and being able to really, um, you know, take care of themselves. And then also, you know, as I've gotten into doing scalp micropigmentation and having more of a focus on the scalp, you know, I see it's, it's the same. You know, in terms of our skin, um, our scalp, the condition of our scalp is very poor. Um, and it's, it's the same thing. And I think it's just a, a lot of times just a, a knowledge gap there. And, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on so we can really talk about, you know, hair loss. And because the barbershop is one of those places where you can have, um, you know, really great conversations and share, um, you know, share, uh, you know, personal things that are going on. As you know, as you well know, you know, we wear a lot of different hats and, um, you know, our clients can find in us. And, but hair loss is one of those things that um, guys don't talk about, you know, in terms of, oh, we just get finished playing basketball and, well, you know, by the way, you know, my, my hair is shedding, you know, it's not one of those things that we typically have a conversation, you know, about. Um, so what are some of the, uh, you know, typical, uh, most common causes, you know, of hair loss, or, you know, just kind of, you know, just kind of define it for us. What What is hair loss? Yeah. So it's a great question. And it's a very long answer. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. okay. Um, so hair loss, the medical mm-hmm. term for hair loss is called alopecia. Okay. And 
we generally divide alopecia into two smaller but large categories. And so one category is called non-scarring alopecia okay. and the other is scarring alopecia. So those are the big buckets. Okay. And within each of those buckets, there's probably 20 different causes. Okay. And so like when we go to dermatology conferences, there are two hour lectures on hair loss. Wow. Wow. I have a um, dedicated hair loss clinic in my practice and each one of those patients, the first time visit is probably 45 minutes because we have wow. to go through a lot. Okay. Um, so to kind of summarize um, two broad categories, mm -hmm. the non-scarring alopecia, you can have things, you know, it, it, most people are on some sort of a medication, even if it's okay. an antihistamine. So if you read the insert to the mm -hmm. medicine, if you're on high blood pressure, diabetes medicine, you'll see blah, 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 and hair loss, right? Mm -hmm. so every mm -hmm. medication can potentially cause hair loss. Right. Then you have the type of hair loss that you may get as you get older. And so mm -hmm. that's called androgenetic alopecia. And okay. so that typically is thinning of the hair. So if you look at your gene pool, your next generation up, you can probably pretty much predict what's going to happen to you. So, okay. you know, that mm. what that serves as is a um, pink flags, right? So if you see what's going on with your next generation, then you have the opportunity to see how you're going to age and do some prevention or some lifestyle changes to manage Okay. That. Okay. So, so always, go ahead. next generation, you, like in terms of like my dad or or does it typically skip a generation in terms of like granddad or, you know, so it's, it's typically yeah. the next generation. Okay. Yeah. And even if you've got older brothers, right. Okay. And so, you know, it's, it's not that if, if someone in your family who is genetically related to you has hair loss, then you okay. have a risk factor similar to diabetes, similar mm. to high blood pressure. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always tell my patients, next time you have a family reunion, you go study your people because mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm, going to give you mm -hmm, some clues mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. what's going to happen to you. Right, and right, so, right. You know, so we have um, nutritional deficiencies. So um, there are people who go on fast weight loss issues, people who've had mm. gastric bypass, you're losing okay. a tremendous amount of weight very quickly, <clears throat> or if you are out working out and or you need to diet or lose weight, what the weight loss does is depending on if you're really eliminating and restricting your calories, okay. you could absolutely have a type of hair loss related to that, which is a stressor on your body. Mm. If you have decided that you are just not going to eat certain things or, you know, sadly, if you've got an eating disorder, you know, mm -hmm. all the more reason. And mm -hmm. then the big issue that I'm seeing a lot of right now is stress related hair loss. And ah, so it okay. is huge. So typically stress related hair loss starts about three months after a stressful event. And so let's say, for example, you have to go have your appendix out. Mm -hmm. While you're in the hospital, you might have not been feeling well prior to that. And then three months after the surgery, you may have a little bit of hair shedding. Okay. So we see this really, most commonly we'll see this particular type of hair loss, which is called telogen effluvium. Okay. We'll see that in women who've delivered babies, but the delivery is a stressor. So we have it also seen it in people who have had a death in the family or a major life change, you know, mm -hmm. you've got a great job in California, but you got to pick up your life and move to California. Right, that's right, stressful. right, right. So yeah. with a, a lot of the, I'm sorry, just a lot of the life changes and the stressors that typically happen, it is is the um, advice just to, how, how do, how do, how do you, you know, share with your clients to kind of manage that stress? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, that is such a huge conversation and a great question. And so one of the, one of the things that we do know, and, you know, just talking a little bit about stress for a second, um, you know, when, COVID first hit in mm -hmm. March. Mm -hmm. um, we closed our office for nine weeks. I know you all were closed for a little while as well. Sure. Um, you know, I told my staff, um, March, April, May, June, our June hair loss clinic is going to be out of control. 
and it right, was. Right, 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 right. So, you know, I have, it's not lost on me at all what people have been going through this year. Mm. And, you know, we have all been in what I call survival mode. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You got to do mm -hmm. what you got to do. You know, hopefully everybody's healthy. You got to figure out, you know, how to pay the bills and not go to work and, mm -hmm. you know, how to do things remotely and, you mm -hmm. know, all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But we, that is a chronic stressor. As humans, we don't do well not being able to control things. Right. And so when there are things that are out of our control, we have to manage that with stress. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then we drill down on the other things like the microaggressions and what else happened this year, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, a lot mm -hmm. of stuff happened this that's year. Right. Um, that's right. We had that's, the election, a... we had, you know, a lot of things happened. Yeah. Take so, your pick. <laughs> take your pick. Yeah. And so yeah. it was one thing after the other. And so, you know, when we, when we talk about telogen effluvium, which is the stress related hair loss, there is a trigger. You wait mm -hmm. three months and you shed hair for five months. The problem that most people have is we don't live in a box. So let's right. say, say, for example, your grandmother is ill. You, she tells you about her illness, wait three months, lose hair for five months. Mm -hmm. Then she has to have surgery, wait three months. Right. Five. It's a continual thing. Yeah. Yes. It's a continual yes. thing. Every time wow. you trigger, it can, and that can be a chronic process. And so now we have people who come in and say, I have been losing my hair for a year. And I'm like, of course you have, right? Right. It's right. not a surprise. So in answer to your question, what can you do? You know, I think one of the things, sadly, that brown people are way too comfortable and way too used to is managing chronic stress, right? Mm. So we have had chronic stress, whether that is from, you know, childhood trauma to not getting the job, being terminated from a job, you know, everything, Just all, of this, my, all of it. Right. And so, you know, so we are used to, managing it or sort of like we're, we're dealing with it right, right dealing with it right mm -hmm. and so do you think that there's any surprise as far as why there's a higher incidence of blood pressure and high blood pressure and diabetes and early death in brown people is there any right. surprise to that right it's right. chronic stress yeah right? it's, it's so, all it's all connected and it's you know all connected it, yeah all connected. And, and it also makes me think about um you know the children as well you know i have two uh, my son is 19, just finished his first year um, online, you know, in college. Um, and my daughter, 16, uh, 11th grade, you know, rising junior. And, and think about the same stresses that, that children, um, you know, are faced with as well. Um, and, and you're right. I think that, you know, we're just seeing, you know, just from a kind of public health, you know, perspective, you know, we're really just, we haven't even seen you know, a lot of the ramifications of what we've just gone through, you know, with COVID. So what would be the message to, you know, even to our children, you know, in terms of, I guess it's maybe just the same in terms of managing, you know, stress, but do you see high incidences of hair loss in children as well? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, and so as far as the hair loss component, and again, kind of getting back to the bigger picture, of managing stress i think again because brown people are so chronically in survival mode mm -hmm. it is important to make sure you have a support system and manage your stress and so whether that in a healthy way so that means exercising that means sleeping well that means eating well mm -hmm. that means going to talk to a counselor if you need to go talk to a counselor okay. there is no shame in it and we know that brown people are much more hesitant to go and seek mental health services mm -hmm. but the reality mm -hmm. is is brown people got every reason <laughs> to <laughs> be and then some right this is true so, this is true you know this is so, true so taking a step back and really recognizing that you have to, you have to take care of yourself if you're going to be good to anybody else. And, mm -hmm. you know, as far as the children, we model behavior for our children, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you are struggling, what braver thing to do than to tell your kids you're going to go see the counselor because you need to work on some things. Like That's right. exactly right. You got to model exactly. behavior. And, you know, I have seen children little kids even, you know, I've seen like three, four-year-olds who have another type of hair loss where you tend to lose 
hair in one little area that's called alopecia areata. Mm -hmm. Again, that is very common and is associated with stress. Wow. Um, I'm some thyroid disorders, but usually when I see that in children, I'm like, what else is going on? And depending on the age of the child, right? So little kids can't always verbalize what is happening, but invariably it may be you got a four-year-old at home and now there's a new baby and the four-year-old is pissed mm -hmm. off. Right, right, right. right, <laughs> right. Can't tell that's you they're right, pissed that's off, right, that's but right. they're pissed off. Right, <laughs> so right, right, they that's might right. develop some hair loss, right? I had a gentleman a few years ago who had alopecia areata in his beard, and we were treating him, and it mm -hmm. just wasn't responding. I'm like, look, what is happening? Mm -hmm, and he was, mm -hmm. he was engaged to be married, and he did not want to be. So, wow, <laughs> wow, wow. That out. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, since so stress can rear its head in many ways, and you know, and I often share with my patients that if you are in here with a stress-related hair loss, this is your body's way of giving you an SOS. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that could be, otherwise, you could end up with a stroke or a heart attack. So listen to your body. Yeah. yeah do what yeah. you need to do to manage your stress in a healthy way. So Interesting, yeah. As as uh, as a beauty industry, you know, the barbering, the beauty and the barber industry professionals, what can we do, you know, with our clients in terms of, um, you know, helping to kind of slow the progression, you know, of hair loss or try to turn the tide a little bit? What, what advice do you have, you know, for us, you know, as professionals, things that we can do, you know, with our clients? Yeah. You know, I think it's... Um really important because you all are the first line, right? We mm -hmm. often see, you know, men and women, you're looking at people's scalps all day. And so mm -hmm. I would say, if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. you know, I have a lot of patients who, um, um, who sometimes don't understand that some of the things that they are doing, not necessarily their barber or hairstylist, mm -hmm. they are doing things to damage their scalp. So one of the big issues I see it more in women than in men, mm -hmm. but um, less frequent hair washing, right? You have yeah. to clean your scalp. You have yeah. to wash your scalp. You yeah. would never go a month without taking a shower. So <laughs> you cannot go a month without washing the skin on your head. You just right. Can't. Right. And so, you know, <laughs> finding hairstyles that allow you to access your scalp so that you can have a healthy scalp. A healthy scalp mm. is a clean scalp. So let's just start there. That's a good that's a good way to kind of connect it in terms of you won't go a month without you know taking washing your body. And it's the same kind of thing in terms of taking care of our scalp. Because we see that a lot with the younger guys. You know, they want a lot of the looks like the NBA players have, you know, with a lot of the hair. Um, but then the maintenance isn't there. You know, they're not taking care of it. Yeah. Um, and then there's a disconnect in terms of, you know, mom and dad in terms of staying after them, in terms of making sure that they are taking care of the hair, you know, and, and their scalp. Because like you said, you know, mom and dad are trying to shift and deal with all of the shifts from um, all of the transition that we've been going through. But I think there's a real um, opportunity there, um, you know, as, as, as beauty industry professionals to kind of help educate um, yeah. that's a great analogy. It's a great way to put it. I really, really like that. You may what have my permission to use it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. We, we, we got that. We got that on yeah. video. Thank you yeah, so much. I mean, the other thing is, um, you know, you hear a lot about protective styling, right? Okay. So let's talk mm. about that. Protective you know, pro styling. Okay. Um, I okay. don't even like that word because... Um, I understand the basis for it, but really we have to distinguish between protective styling and convenient styling. Mm, okay. Okay. Because convenient styling is a style that you will have to do nothing to for what, two, three, four weeks. That's mm. not protective. Mm -hmm, That's not mm -hmm. protecting your scalp. Okay. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to manage sweat and heat and over processing with convenience and we're talking about stress it is so complicated this is such a complicated conversation because you know we know that brown people have a higher incidence of high blood pressure diabetes right stroke and obesity right mm -hmm. how are you gonna how are you gonna do that how are you gonna manage that you have to get out and exercise 
you have your corporate job at the law firm and you have to look a certain way mm -hmm. because people are going to talk <clears> about <throat> you if you've got some ethnic hairstyle. Right. right so right, what are you going right. to do? You're going to go right. get a weave or you're going to, you right. know, wear a wig and right. you're going to keep the weave in because you paid a lot of money for it. You're going to yep. keep it in until it's, you know, looking a little fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> then, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you're not going to exercise. You're not going right. to exercise because it's going right. to mess up your hairstyle. Right. So it is this cycle of um, choices that yeah. people have to make, um, you know, really between their health and their hair. Mm. And, mm. you know, it's an important <clears throat> conversation to have with people um, because they have to choose their health. You know, it's a good, uh, you made me think about something um, that we can possibly make a breakthrough on. How do we get clients to override persona for health? Well, how, how I'm going to, how folks are perceiving me, how I'm going to be perceived at the job, what folks are saying and prioritizing health. You know, it's interesting is I think some of that is we bring that on ourselves, mm. right? Um, there was a, um, I, I used to live in Chicago and there was a newscaster in Chicago who um, decided that she was going to go on air with her natural hair and do the, mm. do the broadcast. And she went and had like a super cute little two strand twist normally she had had her hair blown out what i call the newscaster look mm -hmm. and she did the little cute natural hairstyle and she mm -hmm. went on air she did the news and then she turned to her co-anchor who was a caucasian male mm -hmm. she said what do you think about my hair mm. and he was like i didn't even notice you're gorgeous i, mm. I didn't even notice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then they took the clip and they went out and on the streets of Chicago, and they would show this to people and, and ask them, what do you think about her hair? And it was fascinating. Who said what? Wow. Wow. And people that were the most critical about her not looking professional mm -hmm. were Black women. Wow. Wow. Right? That's a whole nother IG it's a whole other level. Brooke. It's a whole other conversation. It's a whole other conversation. Absolutely. But, you know... Yeah. When you, I, and, and this is true of a lot of things, right? So I have patients who, we're, we're all much more self-critical. We're much mm -hmm. more critical of ourselves than other people are, right? I'm to this, I'm to that. People see this flaw or that flaw. The real, mm -hmm. reality is, is people, first of all, are not looking at you that closely, right? right? right so right, so right, get out of the right. mirror That's right. and stop taking yourself that seriously. Right. But, um, you know, if we would just focus on our health, mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. a lot of this, we would have some other options. Yeah. Because it, you know, especially now, especially when we have all of this burden of stress, mm -hmm. you, it is so hard to not, you know, people have gained 15, 20 pounds over COVID. Mm -hmm. Couldn't go to the gym, too mm -hmm. afraid to go outside. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to manage it? You know, it yeah. snowballs. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it has to be a broader conversation. Often when I have patients who are concerned about how they're going to be perceived at work and they need to, you know, so what? Are, why are they in my office having this conversation? They're in my office because their hair is overprocessed, because they have traction alopecia, because they've been wearing wigs or braids for years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, my conversation with them is, look, you keep down this path, you will have no hair. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. We have 100,000 hair follicles on our head. They do not regenerate. They are a limited resource. Mm -hmm. And so once they have scarred down, and that's the other bucket that we haven't talked about, the scarring alopecia, okay. that is usually due to chronic inflammation. Once they've scarred down, they're gone. So we have to intervene and manage this inflammation so that it does not cause damage, permanent yeah. damage to your hair follicle. Yeah, yeah. What, you, what are, you know, when someone comes in and you have that conversation, um, 
you know, with a prospective client, what are some of the treatment offerings, uh, you know, that you offer there, um, yeah. you know, at your, at your office there? Yeah. So, you know, usually that's why the first visit is, is a long one because we have this conversation and um, some of it is what are you doing to work out? Like, what is your life like? Or do you sweat heavily in your head? Because sweat, sweat itself, you know, what is dried sweat? It's salt. And so mm -hmm. the salt crystal, it causes friction and it causes breaking. Mm -hmm. So people who sweat mm -hmm. heavily in their head, yeah. they're chronically itchy. And yeah. so even men, right? Mm -hmm. So just talking about what do you use in the shower? Use a conditioner, rinse, you know, co-wash. You've got to get that sweat out. You can't mm -hmm. have a sweaty scalp unwashed for weeks on end and think that you're right. not going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. So some of it is what does your lifestyle look like? What do you do? And what do you want to look like? Um, you know, as far as your hairstyling, I am always a little heartbroken when I have women come in and say that they don't like their natural hair, you know, and that's, that's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. You know, it's like, if you don't like your natural hair, that's what you were born with. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what, what are some of the other, you know, for men, you know, you know we have, uh, you know, a lot of men in the barbershop. What would be some of the treatments, uh, you know, for men? You know, yeah. you come in, you have that conversation yeah. with them. And um, yeah. what are some of the treatments that you, that you offer there? So if we're talking about um, the type of hair loss that you get when you get older, which is okay. the androgenetic alopecia, the easiest thing to start with is something over the counter, which is called Rogaine or Minoxidil. Okay. Okay. That is topical and mm -hmm. it comes in the drugstore. It's 2% is women's, 5% in men's. It is topical that you apply to the area. The trick there though is, as with all hair loss, is understanding the results are never immediate. Mm -hmm. hair, hair, the hair that you have on your head in this moment is reflective of your health status three months ago. Mm. So it's not real okay. time, right? Yeah, so that's yeah, why, yeah. again, getting back to the stress-related hair loss, we can have a yeah. major stressor today, right. but it's not going to show up or be evident as far as hair loss for three months from now. Okay. And so a lot of people make that disconnect and like, well, my hair's fine. I'm fine. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, just wait for it. Wait for right, it. Right, for right, it. right, right. Um, so mm -hmm. you have to use the medication consistently for okay. about three to four months before you can make a judgment about whether or not it's going to be beneficial for you. Now, the okay. other hook with hair loss is expectation, right? Mm. And so a lot of times, let's say you have a, an ear infection, you go to the doctor, you get antibiotics for 10 days and your ear infection is gone. It's cured. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With hair loss, you have to use the medication for three months. And then what is, what are we judging? Right. So a lot okay. of patients are like, well, my hair hasn't come back. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, has it gotten any worse? Because right. that's that's the goal. Right. right. The right. goal is to keep you where you are right now. Mm -hmm. So the expectation is not that we're going to make you look like a Chia pet because we're not. Right. The and that's, that's, a, that's a big challenge because, yes. you know, we're in this kind of microwave society where yeah. I want it done now and I want hair growth tomorrow. Um, we so want a, a lot of things. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's a long range game. That's Welcome right. Welcome to yeah. my life. I have yes. this conversation 25 times a day wow. about, you know, it didn't really, it didn't happen overnight. So why would you expect that it's going to get better overnight? You can't. Right. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about realistic expectations. And, you know, often I will say to people, you are absolutely, absolutely allowed to want what you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I can give it to you. But you can want it. This is true. This is true. <laughs> this is true. So, this is true. Yeah. <clears throat> Interesting. A another um, challenge that I've heard over the years from a lot of guys. Well, one, you know, we're not taking care, you know, of our skin, right? In terms of some kind of uh, regimen, you know, in terms of cleansing the face. Break down cleansing, exfoliating. Soap from the drugstore, you know, $500 products, you know, kind of break it down in terms of what is a, what can I share with my guys in terms of, okay, this is just um, 
good health practices, you know, that what you can do and taking care of, of, of your skin, of your face. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the skin is skin is skin is skin, right? So skin, okay. scalp is skin. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, you know, some simple things, um, wash your face, first of all. Okay. Um, let's not use deodorant soap. Let's start. There. Okay. 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 Um, okay. okay. You know, I am, I have a sister. I, I did not grow up with brothers. You know, I have my, have my father. Mm -hmm. So it's always really fascinating to me when I look at my male patients and I'm like, well, how did you learn that? Like what, who, what? So, so um, women <laughs> will never torture their skin. Men will torture their skin. Interesting. There's Interesting. no reason, yeah. like, right? So, <laughs> Let's talk about shaving for a minute, okay? And okay, yes, I yes, do have yes. some. Fem I do have some female patients who shave because they've got unwanted hair, or they okay. shave their armpits or their legs. Men shave their face, right? Yes. Uh, when men, my male patients tell me that they use aftershave on their face, I'm like, you would never see a woman put alcohol on her legs after shaving her legs or her armpits. What? What Very is that? Very true. Right. Very true. It, you know, there's a belief that it has to hurt for it to be a benefit. It doesn't have to hurt. It's especially, it you know, with dirt. men. You know, if it's not bruising, you know, if I don't feel it, it's not working. You no. know, kind of thing. It's it's a lot we have to dispel. You know, yeah, let's un of, let's undo <laughs> that because right, you don't right. and, and here's why, right? So <laughs> you know, and and I, I do try and walk people through like let's let's think about why we would do that or why mm -hmm. you might have thought that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, alcohol is a disinfectant. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. well, maybe you're trying to disinfect your face. Was that why you did that? I don't know, but you're not <laughs> infected. Right. 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 <laughs> so that whole knowledge gap is not there. Okay. It's 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 just not there. You, you, you but that's good. That's that's really good. You know, you don't need to disinfect your face because you're not infected. No. That's good. That's good. No, that's this good. gentle cleanser. <laughs> okay, and, gentle cleanser. You know, cleanser. so okay. let's talk about the purpose of your skin, right? The skin is your largest organ. Largest yeah. organ in the body. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's actually an organ. Mm -hmm. It serves to as a barrier, like saran wrap over a bowl of onions. Okay. Your skin mm -hmm. is a barrier between you and the outside world. Okay. So it keeps all of your other organs, your heart, your lungs, everything inside mm -hmm. and prevents all of the outside elements from damaging your inside. Right. And it keeps the outside, the pollution, the viruses, the bacteria from getting to your inside. So your mm -hmm. skin is actually the most important organ because it keeps you alive. Right, right, right. So right. <clears throat> it manages temperature regulation, it manages your sweat, it manages heat, it manages sensation. So when your barrier is broken because mm -hmm. of irritation, because of picking, because of using things that are too harsh, okay, you now have a problem because mm. it is not functioning as a barrier between you and the outside world. It's been broken. Okay. It's been yeah, broken. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So okay. less wow. is more. You really want to not strip your skin of oil because oil is there for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of patients who have really oily skin, and I see this all the time, they're using alcohol or witch hazel or all this mm -hmm. stuff. I'm like, Okay, well, if you strip your skin of oil, and by the way, you can use that entire bottle of witch hazel or alcohol, and you're still going to see a brown stuff on the cotton ball, because what is that stuff? That stuff is called sebum, which is oil. Mm -hmm. Your body makes oil as a lubricant. It will never mm -hmm. stop making oil, so you will okay. never get rid of it. So stop it. Okay. <laughs> stop trying. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Interesting. <clears throat> You, you're bringing up so many, you know, different, different things to think about. Um, so one, let's talk about razor bumps. Let's talk about, you know, the guys when they shave, a lot of, um, you know, African American men, they can't take a, a razor, you know, on the face. Um, so talk about razor bumps. And where does that come from? And, and that, that, that thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, when you look at 
um, hair, mm -hmm. hair texture and the amount of curl in hair is different. Mm -hmm. But typically when people, brown people, when you've got darker skin, you tend to have curlier hair. Curly hair. Yep. When you, and because of that, the hair follicles is, is actually a different shape. And so people who've got um, very, very straight hair have a very straight hair follicle. People mm -hmm. with that wavy hair, a little bit curved, and African-American very curly hair is, is almost C-shaped, mm -hmm. which is why when the hair exits, it is curly. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yep. When you <clears throat> shave, and particularly if you are doing the fade in the back, or because mm -hmm. it's the same process, mm -hmm. or if you are shaving really close, mm -hmm. you cut the hair and you create a sharp edge on this hair. Okay. And okay. then what happens? Your hair is curly. So this sharp edge is going to curl back into your skin. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. it does that, your body, our bodies are very, very smart. Our bodies are always on alert mode to try and take care of us. Mm -hmm. And so when your body, even though it made this hair, sees this thing coming back, it's like, I don't know what that is. It mm. could be a bee stinger. I, it could be a piece of glass. I don't know what that is. Okay. So okay. let me go into fight <clears throat> mode and protect okay. my person. Okay. And what it does is it forms a bump which is called mm -hmm. an inflammatory response. Okay. And the longer that bump is in there, the longer the bump is there, it can potentially cause a scar. Mm. So the, and same thing on the back, right? And so the super fade cut, mm -hmm. the hair curls back in, the body mm -hmm. reacts to it because it doesn't understand what it is. Mm. And it walls it off by making a bump in an effort to protect you from what it perceives is a danger. So what, what can our clients do? And also what can we do as barbers after we do that shave? Yeah. Let's say if they, if they get a hot lather shave yeah. or if they do get the close fade, yeah. what can we do, you know, to, um, you know, to, after the service? Well, you know, looking at you, right, you have a little five o'clock shadow. So ish, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. You know, so some of this also depends on, the indus industry that men work in, mm -hmm. right? So there's certain industries that require you to be clean shaven, mm -hmm. you know, military, like military, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. military. It used to be police firemen. I mean, firemen, it's a risk. You can't mm -hmm. have the beard interfering with the seal on all that gear that they wear. Mm -hmm. um, but banking, you know, laws, there's certain industries that are very, very conservative. And so, now, you know, I, again, I'm not from North Carolina, but, you know, mm -hmm, it's a mm -hmm. thing. Beard, beards are a thing here, right? So, this is true. So, this is true. Yes, so, yes. You know, it, it's more socially acceptable to have a beard mm -hmm. and look professional. So that's a good thing. So if you want to grow a beard, I would say do it because that's mm -hmm. ultimately going to be easier on your skin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for the shaving, though, if you can get away with a five o'clock shadow instead okay. of being super closely shaven that Leave would some also more be beneficial and okay. same thing on the back like i have some male patients they are going to get their hair cut i have some that go every week mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know so if there's a problem certainly there are things that we can do to address it mm -hmm. um but <clears throat> what i usually tell them is maybe go a little less frequently Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. tell your barber to not cut it so close. So close. Okay. And that will all be helpful because it's really, we want the curl of the hair to curl on top and not dig itself in. Not back in, right. Yeah. And then you get that response from the skin. Yeah. Absolutely. So, in, in, so this is a parallel question um, with barbering. A lot of times we do have, um, you know, guys who do get the hot lather shave or they get their head shaved. And then parallel with scalp micropigmentation, um, we're actually depositing pigment, you know, into the scalp, you know, with the needle. What, how should we prepare the scalp, yeah. you know, for the razor, for yeah. SMP, you know, just that preparation process. Yeah. Well, you know, the micropigmentation, that is a procedure. And so mm -hmm. that you, sh you absolutely should disinfect prior to that. I mean, okay. mm -hmm. you know, whenever I do any kind of procedures, I swipe with alcohol or you can use a surgical scrub or, you know, something, but 
you're breaking the skin. So right. you do need to disinfect prior to that. Yep. And yep. so I'm not sure what your protocol is, but I would most definitely make sure that, you know, they either give themselves a good shampoo before mm -hmm. they come in for the procedure or you all do it, that there's no open sores on the scalp. Mm -hmm. So if they've been mm -hmm. scratching or itching, all of that is resolved. Mm -hmm. um, and that, um, you know, you just disinfect prior to the procedure. Mm -hmm. Now, how about for a, a shave, a old, good old school hot lather shave? We typically use steam towels, mm -hmm. two, three yeah. steam towels. Yeah. Um, the, um, um, the um, you know, the cream, you know, for the face, mm -hmm. um, the lather, you know, lather them up, you know, really well um, and get those, you know, sebaceous glands, you know, working so the, you know, the razor can glide, you know, yeah. on the skin. Is, is that kind of, yeah, you know, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. In fact, a lot of times when, with my younger male patients or people who've got PFB and that's what it's called, pseudofolliculitis Barbie in the okay. back, it's called acne keloidalis nuki, but it's basically the same process. Okay. And so I will always ask them, you know, have you ever seen those movies, those old movies where they put the towels on and they do that thing in the barbershop? Have you seen that? Right. right That's right, what you want right. to do. And so, right, you know, right. even at, and mm -hmm. why? Because the steam and the warmth hydrates the hair and it makes it stand mm -hmm. up. And so you get a better okay. shave. And yes. so, you know, for men who are shaving at home, they can do a version of that. They can either do it after they finish with their hot shower, even though I wouldn't recommend it for dry skin, but you know, it is what it is. Okay. So, okay. you know, that would be a good opportunity or they can just take a warm towel if they're going to shave at home and put that on for a few minutes and, you know, go ahead and do the rest of their process. Um, in terms of, ex what does exfoliation do? Uh oh, uh oh, I, I didn't do it. I didn't say it. No, I didn't. <laughs> these, yeah, these, you know, these, these are these are barbershop questions. Yeah, you know, I know. Should I, I know. exfoliate? You know, yeah, so we trying to get the truth out there. We talking yeah, to yeah. the expert here. Yeah, yeah. I've never been a fan. Um, okay, okay. And and here's why. You know, I, I I will say I've never been a fan really of exfoliating the face. Our bodies do really a great job of taking care of us. Okay. Right. And skin cells on our face, the natural cell cycle or the natural cycle of growth is every 30 to 45 days, our skin cells completely turn over. Okay. okay. What that means is they grow up and they fall off. We, are, we lose a lot of skin cells every single day. So our bodies actually do a perfectly fine job of exfoliating. Mm. Mm. As humans, we like to control things <clears throat> and sometimes mess things up. <laughs> and so when we go in there and scrub too much or we try and exfoliate, it may be that your skin's not quite ready. Okay. It may be you are using some gritty cleanser or something with a little grit to it that is irritating your skin that you then end up with discoloration. You're wondering why your skin is so dark. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes the best advice is to leave it alone and let your body do its work. Okay. That's not okay. what we want to hear in our microwave society. This is true. This is true. But is true. sometimes that is best. We don't always mm -hmm. have to intervene with mm -hmm. everything. Now, where I will say you can exfoliate, if you have crusty feet mm -hmm. and rusty, crusty elbows, for mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Right. Okay. But, but not to excess. You right. can't scrub your skin away. And, and when you scrub too much, there's another process called lichenification where, again, our bodies are smart. It's like, oh, what? why do I keep getting irritated on my elbow? Let me protect myself, and I'm going to grow some extra skin. Okay. I'm going to make it okay. thick. All right? Okay. So okay. sometimes in our efforts to try and make some things better – we make it worse. Mm, mm, so mm, mm, our bodies are, you know, 80% of the time, if we would just let it be, it will be mm, mm, fine. That's good. That's good. That's good. <clears throat> Over your practice, I know, you, you know, you've seen an explosion, you know, of um, a lot of the, the cosmetic, I guess, procedures, you know, in terms of, you know, 
the the cheeks, the the lips, and things of that nature. T- tell me a little bit about that because I, I know you've been you know you've been doing it for a while, and it seems to be the uh, um, popular thing you know uh, you know of the day. What kind of um, you know advice do you have you know for folks who are considering um, you know cosmetic procedures and, and and going about it in a safe and uh, you know ethical way? Yeah, um, start there first of all, safe and ethical. Right. So um, all of these procedures are medical procedures, Mm -hmm. right, which means that they should be done in a medical environment. Okay. Um, You know, a lot of the procedures like Botox or fillers, they're while they may look easy to do Mm -hmm. and tempting, like, oh, I can do that in order to do it right and correctly and without incidents or minimize your incidents, you need to have a understand understanding of anatomy. And you also need to understand how to manage if something goes wrong. Right. There are a lot of procedures out there. that are very easy to do, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. if you're going to do them, you also need to be able to manage the complications. Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. absolutely with with fillers you can blind somebody with a filler wow okay and i yeah i I don't think a lot of that you know is shared you know in terms yeah 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 yeah. it is not and so you know i i do have some patients who will say things like well you're more expensive than you know this other place down the street and i I'm, you know, first of all, I don't ever apologize for my education. That's absolutely. So my education was not free, by the way. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, you, you know, you make your choice, mm-hmm. but you make your choice, and yeah, yeah. if you are comfortable with someone who is not trained to, or you know, a group on, then you've made your choice. <clears throat> Right, right. Yeah, definitely have to do your, you know, folks have to do their research, you know, prior to getting, um, you know, any of these, uh, you know, procedures done, because it could turn out, you know, for the worst. And, you know, we want everyone to be healthy and living the best life that they can be. Yeah. What, you know, in terms of just, you know, what kind of just kind of overall kind of global advice, you know, do you have for us in terms of um, taking, having our best skin. I saw on your website, having the best skin of our lives, you know, how, how do we go about having the best skin of our lives? So, you know, I would say let's start with, you know, really an education about what we need to do to protect our skin. And some of that is, are there any skin problems that run in the family? Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's address if we have acne or eczema, let's get it addressed. You know, I see a lot of teenagers where, you know, even if I'm, I'm not at work, I'll be at the grocery store. This is pre mask because you can't see anything with the mask, but you know, and I'm like, if you have acne, treat it. You're mm-hmm. not going to grow out of it. Mm. Or you're not going to grow out of it without having some issues like hyperpigmentation or scarring. Mm-hmm. And I have had some patients who've got awful scarring and knowing that if there had been some intervention earlier, it would have minimized that. Okay. So, yeah. you know, making sure that if you have um, a medical issue, get it addressed by a board certified dermatologist, because that's what mm. we do all day, every day. This yep. is not something that you're going to treat on YouTube or Instagram. Right. You go see right. a, a, a real doctor, an MD. A real doctor, yep. yep. Um, secondly, don't pick. Like a lot mm. of people will pick at their skin. Mm. If you are picking, you are potentially causing a scar. So don't okay. do that. Okay. okay. Thirdly, wear some sunscreen. Brown people tend not to do that. And I always tell my patients, if you mm. are in here telling me that you are mostly concerned about some discoloration and you have acne that you're picking at and you are not wearing sunscreen, that is a total disconnect for me. So okay. you have to do your part in protecting your skin. Right. Mm-hmm. Thirdly, or fourthly, make sure you are, you know, skin is really a reflection of our overall health. Mm, so that's good. That's if you good. are 
diabetic or you've got high blood pressure or thyroid problem, make sure that those things are controlled. Make yeah. sure that you are minimizing your risk factors. And so that means eating more healthfully, eating, mm -hmm. you know, more whole food, less processed yeah. food. Yeah. That means exercising. That yeah. means because you feel better, you look better. So yeah. all of these, that means taking care of your mental health, you know, because all of these things do play a role in our skin and our you hair. Know, yeah. You know, we, it's interesting. You know, we've come full circle, um, you know, back to um, taking care of ourselves holistically, you know, our eating, our health, our environment, um, managing stress, um, you know, all of those things play a factor. I really, really like what you said. Um, you know, the condition of our skin is a reflection of our, of our overall health. And you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we see, you know, folks all the time, you know, you can tell there's something going on, you know, possibly medically, um, just from the condition, uh, you know, of, of the skin. Um, and, and that also, you know, goes into the condition of the scalp. Yes. You know, as well, like you said, skin and skin. Um, this has been wonderfully enlightening, um, you know, for me, Dr. Brooke. And, nice. and, um, and I know that a lot of folks will be, uh, you know, enriched by this. And I really, really appreciate your time yeah. and, um, you know, sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us. And, you know, you, you, you're making a difference. Continue <laughs> to do it. And I really, really appreciate you. And, um, <laughs> you know, come we, next time when uh, James comes over and gets his cut, you know, come come visit as well. I <laughs> will. I have to start sending miles um, as our son. Um, Wonderful. There. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you again, um, you know, on behalf of the Renaissance Barbershop and Scalp Work and um, um, the re uh, Reflections from the Chair. We really appreciate your time and your, and your expertise. No, thank you, Tim. It's awesome. I would love to do this. Thanks. Awesome, awesome. Okay. Well, thank you. You have a great day. Get some rest. I yeah, will. Get some rest. From your okay. Day and, uh, okay, we'll chat right. soon. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.